Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to a new Zor Education. Um, today I would like to continue talking about oscillations, but in this particular case um, uh, it's not the same kind of oscillation which we were talking about in the previous lecture. The previous lecture was about um, reciprocal movement, like on the spring, for instance, you have a, an object at the end of the spring and it's going back and forth along straight line. Today we will talk about oscillations which are related to rotation. Um, so, the lecture is called rotational oscillations. Sometimes it's called torsional. Uh, it comes with the word torque, which is very important for rotation. Um, now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens. It's presented on unizor.com. This is the website. Um, there is a prerequisite course called Mass for Teens, uh, and whatever information is there is definitely a prerequisite for physics. You have to know mass before you attempt physics. Like, for instance, in this particular case, um, we will talk about uh, differential equations, which is part of the calculus presented in the Mass for Teens course. So, um, now, the website is completely free. Unizor.com has no strings attached. There are no ads, uh, so there is absolutely no financial uh, transactions which are basically result in going into this website. Complete, completely free knowledge in its purest form. So I encourage you to use the website um, to watch this lecture. Um, because the website contains also very detailed notes for every lecture. It also contains certain problems, exams, um, and there are some other functionalities which are related to uh, basically registering, but you don't have to register if you just want to listen to the, uh, to the lectures. Um, registration might be needed if you would like to get engaged into supervised education, then there is some kind of a supervisor or a parent. Um, and then there are students which he is responsible for, etc. That's a separate issue. In any case, all is free. So, rotational or torsional oscillations. Well, first of all, a couple of examples. Um, in the good old times, when the watches <laughs> were mechanical, right now there, many of them are electronics, so it's a completely different story. But in the mechanical world, um, the hand watch had something which was called um, a, a balance wheel. It goes this and this, like this. And there is a spiral spring, actually, which allows um, this uh, rotational oscillation. That's a rotational oscillation. When some kind of a disc or, or, or weight or whatever is going around the circle, that's what makes it rotational. And it goes back and forth. It goes this way along, along the circle and then another way along the circle. That's what makes it oscillating. So that's what oscillations comes from. Rotational oscillations. It's rotating and it's rotating in both directions um, alternatively. Okay, I will talk about a little bit more, mm -hmm. I would say, simple case uh, as an example. My simple case is a, some kind of a wire, let's say it's a steel wire, and there is a rod, uh, so we'll consider the rod to be um, uh, weightless, and there are two weights here of mass M. Now, there is a really a good connection here, a rigid connection. Now, um, it doesn't really matter whether we are talking about uh, this particular wire to be like vertical in the gravitation field. It doesn't really matter. Consider it's in a spaceship. Um, so, my only point in this case is, this is a straight wire, let's say it's a steel wire, and then what you can do, you can actually wind this particular rod 
around which twists the wire. Now, as it twists the wire, uh, there is certain tension in the wire. It's a steel wire, so it's trying to basically uh, untwist itself. So, if I will wind this thing a little bit and let it go, the wire uh, starts untwisting, so it will go the opposite direction. It will pass the point of neutrality and goes even further by inertia. Same thing as with a spring. Spring goes back and forth. Uh, it's reciprocal movement. This goes around this way or around that way. So it will basically oscillate back and forth, back and forth. So this is an example which I would like to, to talk about. So we will do certain calculations and you will see that these calculations are very much like the ones with the spring. So I'll basically come up with some kind of an equation which describes the movement of these masses uh, around the circle. And you will see that that's basically the same kind of laws which uh, are um, in direction, in a straight line direction, they are applicable here. With some modifications, because it's a rotational. So let me just remind something about rotational movement, um, which was presented actually in this course in mechanics part. So whatever is... Um, a force in um, uh, movement along the straight line is basically equivalent to torque uh, when we are talking about um, rotational movement. Why? Well, torque, first of all, by definition, it's radius times force. Now, in a general definition, these are all vectors. But in cases which we are considering, we are considering the force always being perpendicular to the radius, in which case the vector product, which is supposed to be, you know, this is usually the sign for vector product. So um, the vector product actually becomes just a product of uh, these two values, the radius and the absolute value of force. In case these are perpendicular to each other. And that's the case. So that's why I will not use the vectors here. And I will use just a plain multiplication here. OK. So they are playing in some way equivalent role. Force makes certain um, mass to move with certain acceleration, right? Remember? the second laws of New second law of Newton. Now, in terms of rotational movement, um, we would like to use um, angular position and angular speed and angular um, acceleration. So, if the angle is this, it's function of time, angle by which we have turned around the, around the circle. Then the linear speed uh, and linear acceleration depend not only on position of the angle itself, but also on the radius, right? So what A, A is? A is second derivative of position and speed is the first derivative of position. In this case, instead of position along the straight line of certain point, we have an angle which start at certain uh, fixed location, the angle by which we have turned. And now we have uh, if, if you would like, we can obvious, obviously uh, check this length. The length is equal to um, radius times angle. And the linear speed 
is the first derivative of this. And the acceleration, linear acceleration, is corresponding with this. Right? We're just differentiating this. So the part is basically our um, angular speed, angular speed, and this is angular acceleration. So we will use a here, and we will not use phi, uh, the first the derivative at all. So I would like to have something like this in terms of um, torque and uh, mass, obviously, and uh, angular acceleration rather than linear acceleration. Now, how can I do it? Well, uh, I will start from this since f is equal to a, uh, well, mass first, mass times a, right? Now, instead of f, I would like to have torque, so it's r times. Now, instead of a, I would like to have this. I will use this alpha. So what do we have? This is torque. So torque is equal to m um, r square, right? Uh, m times a. a is r right. One second. So it's m a times r. Okay, so it's this r and this r. So it's r square times uh, acceleration alpha. So in terms, this is i called moment of inertia. So in terms of um, torque and moment of inertia and acceleration, this is formula which is basically equivalent to the second Newton's law for rotational movement. So instead of mass, we should use a moment of inertia. Instead of linear acceleration, we are using angular acceleration. And instead of force, we are using torque. So this is equivalent in a rotational. I just derived it, basically. This is the same thing as I did during uh, some lecture about rotational movement in mechanics. So I will use this equivalent to the Newton's law. Um, torque is equal to moment of inertia times alpha. Okay, this is a little deviation from our task here. I just reminded you this rotational thing. So this is the first thing which I would like to talk about. This is equivalent of the Newton's law. Now, if you remember um, in the previous lecture when we were talking about um, spring, um, we used Hooke's law. Remember the Hooke's law? Hooke's law. Now, Hooke's law is this, for linear displacement of the neutral spring. So this is a spring, it's a neutral position. Now we're stretching it by x, and the force, that's minus here because the force goes to opposite stretching, is proportional to displacement, where k is some kind of a characteristic of a spring. Um, obviously, this is not exact law for any kind of a spring and any kind of displacement. No, it's usually about relatively small displacements. 
but it works anyway. It's enough to make some reasonable calculations. Now, what is this in this particular case? We're not stretching any springs, right? But we are twisting the steel wire. Uh, it's really fixed here, but now we are twisting this end. It, it's a steel, so it has certain tension whenever, whenever we are twisting it. And, obviously, as a result of this tension, the steel wire is trying to un, un, untwist itself. So it, it, it actually develops some kind of a torque. It's trying to turn back the, uh, the rod uh, on which we have the masses. Now, it obviously depends on what kind of a steel wire it is, how much we have turned it, etc., etc. But again, there is a similar, there is a similar kind of um, law. Uh, it's a, you can say it's a rotational equivalent of the Hooke's law, and it basically says that the torque is proportional to um, angle of twisting. So if we have, we have turned by a certain thing, it will be certain torque. Uh, which is directed, obviously, to the opposite side because it's trying to untwist itself. So this is the characteristic of the steel wire. And this is an angle by which we have turned this rod and twisted <coughs> the wire. It's really equivalent. Again, it's not universal, but for s relatively small uh, deviations, now, we are not talking about winding it and winding and basically bending the whole steel wire. Yeah, we are talking about just a little bit like half a circle, for instance. Because that's how, by the way, the um, um, how's it called balance wheel in the uh, hand watch. It's turning, but not like the whole thing a few times, right? It's turning by, I don't know, 180 degree, maybe 270 degree maximum. <coughs> so it doesn't really bend the, the, the spring, the, um, uh, the spiral spring inside. So here we also, we're not bending really the steel wire, we're just twisting it a little bit. And then this particular law is working. Now, since we are uh, doing these rotational oscillations, this is a function of time, of course, right? So this thing is also function of time. This is acceleration. Acceleration obviously is always changing. This is the second derivative of um, angle displacement, angular displacement. Now, as we basically did exactly the same thing in the previous lecture, I was um, equating the force expressed using, using the Hooke's law to the force uh, um, presented, the force presented through the second Newton's law. I basically equated them, and that's how I got the differential equation. Here I have exactly the same thing. This is a torque, and its expression as um, uh, in terms of. Um, um, how is it called? Uh, momentum of inertia, moment of inertia, and this is the angular acceleration. The same torque is expressed in terms of qualities of this wire and again angular um, displacement. So we can just equate them and have the differential equation which describes movement of angular movement of this rod. Now, uh, in this particular case, let's do it this way. Now, this is exactly the same differential equation as we had in the previous lecture for a spring. But for the spring, instead of 
uh, moment of inertia, we had mass, and instead of angular displacement, we had linear displacement. Basically, solution is, from the mathematical standpoint, is exactly the same, and I will use the same approach, basically. I have to have some kind of initial condition. Now, initial condition is that my initial turn of this rod by angle phi at time zero is something. I use it gamma as an angle. And let's say that I just turn it by this particular angle gamma and left alone, which means I did not push it in any di di direction, so the first derivative is equal to zero. Now, the second derivative obviously is depending on the torque, etc., etc. So these are initial conditions. And using these initial conditions, I will just do exactly the same as in the previous uh, lecture. I derived basically the, uh, the function which satisfies this differential equation and these initial conditions. So I'll use basically the same function. I'll just write it in different letters. There are different letters involved here. But it's exactly the same differential equation. So my uh, function phi of t is equal to gamma cosine square root of k divided by i times t. So, in, again, in the previous lecture, we had initial linear displacement a, displacement a and that coefficient was a. And uh, instead of uh, moment of inertia, we had mass, so that was k divided by m. So the function is exactly the same, just different letters here. So this is a solution to this differential equation, which means it basically describes how our angle is changing with time. At t is equal to zero, we have cosine of zero, it's therefore, uh, the cosine of zero is one, so times gamma is gamma, so at the, in the beginning. Now the first derivative from cosine is a sine, with a minus sign, with some coefficients, and that's why if you put t is equal to zero, sine of zero is zero, so you will have zero, so it satisfies uh, the initial conditions. And basically what we're saying is this angle is uh, changing from, basically from, now cosine is changing from minus one to one, so this angle is changing from minus gamma to gamma. So it goes to gamma this way, and then gamma that way, to the opposite direction plus, minus, plus, minus. And that's how the whole thing is rotating on this particular wire. And uh, two very important characteristics are um, the period. Now the period is equal to uh, 2 pi. The period of cosine is 2 pi. But if we are um, multiplying by some uh, uh, multiplier, the period would be divided by this multiplier. So I'll put an opposite i divided by k. And the frequency, how many oscillations per second, this is 1 over t. Again, exactly the same as in the previous lecture. I explained a little bit more detailed. That would be 1 over 2 pi. square root of uh, k over i. So k is a characteristic of the spring, uh, not a spring, on uh, a steel wire. That's basically uh, the same kind of characteristic as in a spring uh, in a previous lecture. It's elasticity, um, how springy or how steely this particular wire is. Uh, and I is moment of inertia. So basically, that's it. And it will uh, start oscillating back and forth all the time. Obviously, we are talking about ideal case when there is no friction, etc., etc. Now, one very interesting observation I would like you to make. The period, the period, 
and the frequency of this, they are very similar to each other. There is no gamma here. What does it mean? It means that no matter what my initial turn of the rod around this wire is, the period will be the same. If I will turn it a little bit, the torque will not be very strong, right? And therefore it will be slower. It will be a less distance back and forth. So the gamma would be smaller, which means my angular deviation will be smaller from the neutral position. But linear speed also will be smaller. And the time to cover from plus gamma to minus gamma would be exactly the same as if I turn it initially to a um, bigger angle. Uh, uh, if, if gamma is bigger, so I turn it bigger, my torque is stronger in this particular case because we are twisting the wire a little bit more. And that's why the force is stronger and the speed, linear speed of this uh, mass as it's rotating around the circle would be, um, will, will be greater. But the time will be exactly the same. So no matter how strongly I wind it in the beginning, the time, the period of rotating would be the same and frequency will be the same number of um, oscillations per second. It's a very important observation. And that's why, actually, um, the, uh, this type of movement is used in mechanical watches. Because no matter how strong um, our initial turn is, my, um, my, my wheel, my balance wheel inside the watch will have exactly the same frequency of oscillations. And as the spring unwinding and the force actually becomes weaker, maybe we are not actually turning all the way to the maximum. So but as, as the spring unwinds itself, um, it, it loses energy, right? So it doesn't really turn it all the way to the right and all the way to the left. Let's say it's half away. But still, the period of oscillations will be the same. And that's very, very important for watch. Because we have to have the same period to have the same uh, amount of time uh, which we are kind of measuring. Because with every movement of the wheel in one direction, it's some kind of a fraction of a second or a second or whatever. And it should be exactly the same if we would like our watch to be precise. So that's a very important. Okay, I do recommend you to go to the website, unizor.com. To get to the physics for teens, uh, you just click on the course. Uh, there are some other courses like mass for teens. And inside the physics, you will have another menu. This belongs to the um, part called waves. And uh, it's mechanical waves on the next menu. And then you will find the rotational oscillations. So thank you very much, and good luck. <laughs>